And with uh, the word of God, just to read to you a couple of uh, verses from one of the Psalms. Teach me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offence in me and lead me into the way of everlasting. We're going to sing together, Be still and know that I am God. Be, be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I am God. I am the Lord that He Father God, we thank you, Lord, for the privilege of being able to call you Father, of being able to call you God, of knowing that you are our creator, our saviour, our rock, our foundation, that it is in you, Lord, that we trust. And so, Lord, as we come now to your word, we pray that, Lord, you would prepare our hearts, that, Lord, we may not just hear words that are familiar to us, but that, Lord, you would speak to us through your spirit. Lord, humble us, we pray, and help us to know that you are God and that we are but your creation, for Christ's sake. Amen. Well, it's good, beloved, to uh, have the opportunity of being able to come back and to, to share with you uh, from the word of God, to be able to declare God's goodness uh, to each one of us. And also for me to have the opportunity of personally thanking you for your faithfulness towards Joyce and myself in your prayers over these last six months. In fact, it's nine months ago since I last preached here. Nine months, can you imagine? So if I'm a bit more rusty and dusty than normal, you'll know the reason why. As you know, I've had a bit of a battle with cancer, and I just praise God that I'm through it now that I've been healed of that cancer uh, over this last six months. And I believe that that's in response to your prayers. So all I can say is that at the end of this message, if you don't like it, serves you right for praying. That's right. <laughs> the passage that I've been given this morning is a passage that comes from a series that Simon set for us about how the resurrection should affect the way that we live our lives. And you may remember that he spoke last week about making disciples, and Alistair the week before spoke about salt and light. And the lot has fallen upon me to speak about giving. Now the first part of good news is that I'm not giving you any notes today, um, so you won't get any notes handed out to you. So if you use these messages that we preach on a Sunday, if you use them in your house groups, you need to be writing them down um, uh, for the house group. What I want to do with you is, is to look at these four verses together as Jesus taught them on the Sermon on the Mount 
And then I want to go back over those four same verses again and look at them in the light of the resurrection. In other words, beloved, how does the fact of the resurrection shed even more light on these four verses? So that's, that's what we're doing this morning. So let me read to you verse 1 again. Beware of practicing your righteousness before men, to be noticed by them. Otherwise you will have no reward with your Father who is in heaven. It's not, beloved, that Jesus is against us doing good works. Far from it. What it is, what he's looking at here, is he questions the motive behind these works. Why do we do them? Now, all of us, beloved, we love to be appreciated, we love to, um, to be recognized, we love to be rewarded. But in this, there is a real danger. And the danger is that I do it for the sake of people looking at me rather than looking at the Lord. If my motive is not right for doing good works, if my motive is not right for giving with God, then all I am doing is seeking a reward from those around me who see what I'm doing and what I'm giving. And you may remember, beloved, that it was Paul who wrote in 1 Corinthians 13. He said, you can give everything away, but if you have no love, it counts for nothing. So your gifts and your giving and everything else counts for absolutely nothing if it's not motivated by love. And the Pharisees, poor folks, they were well known for making a religious show of everything that they did. Here in this passage, they made a show about uh, what they gave. You can imagine the, the plate coming around and sort of waving a five-pound note in the, in the air and just, you know, look what I'm putting in. They made a show of that. And then in the next passage here, in verses 5 to 15, it was a show about praying in public. You know, look at me, what a good fellow I am. And then in verses 16 to 18, it was about their fasting. They were showmen. And beloved, what God is saying to us is that these things are between him and ourselves and nobody else, no one else at all. Verse 2 says, When you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets as do the hypocrites in their synagogues or on the streets to be honoured by men. I tell you the truth, they have received their reward in full. And the word hypocrite, and you've heard this before, it means someone who hides his face behind a mask. So he pretends to be something that he really isn't in order to get the praise of those around him. And I want you to notice how that verse finishes there. It says, beloved, they have received their reward in full. In other words, there are no bonus points with God you don't do a good work and God adds a few extra double points or bonus points. You get what you give. And here they were giving to be applauded by those around them. And they got everything and they got nothing. Because it was soon forgotten. Verse 3 and 4. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your giving may be in secret. Then your Father who sees what you do in secret will reward you openly. I've literally tried to do this and it doesn't work for me. One or two times I have put my hand in my wallet or in my purse and I have put straight into the collection bag without knowing what I've given so that my left hand didn't know what my right hand did and I didn't know either. <laughs> Problem was, I sat for the next hour trying to work out how much it was there. <laughs> but you see, again, what, what the Lord is talking about is he's talking about motive. What is your motive for giving? Are you giving because it's expected of you? Are you giving because you think you're buying God? Why are you giving? What is your motive? But I think it also talks about discernment. You see, beloved, not every cause merits the same response. Let me say that again. Not every cause 
merits the same response. I find it very difficult to know who the needy people are. I don't know about you, but I don't know who the needy people are. I know that there are plenty of needs around me. I know that as I walk down Bogner High Street that there are people sitting on the pavement, but I don't know if they're genuine or not. I don't know which ones are homeless. I really don't know uh, who, the, who these folks are. I mean, how can I know which are genuine and which are there simply because they choose to make the wrong choices. I've had people asking for money, only to find out afterwards that they spend that money on smokes and drink, or instead of, on, instead of necessities and, and food and so on. There's one lady in Bogner, and I'm sure you've met her, she comes along with a handout like this, and she says, have you any loose change? And I have given to her, and I know lots of other folks have given to her as well, because she's got such a, a pathetic look about her. And the other day, we were walking behind her, and she went straight into the casino with our cash. Who are the needy? Who are they? How do I discern who the needy are? Let me, beloved, move back onto these four verses now in the light of the resurrection. And by this what I mean is that if we really believe in the reality of the resurrection that we recently celebrated at Easter, how should these words motivate my giving? And what I want to do is I want to be intensely practical here by asking and answering three simple questions. Firstly, why should I give to the poor? Secondly, should I give even if I'm in debt? And thirdly, how can I give if I have so little money myself? So here's my first question. Why should I give to the poor? I think, beloved, that I have shared with one or two of you more than once about my own experience of going as a volunteer, a VSO, age 21, to to India for the first time in my life, leaving home for the first time in my life. And the shock it was to me driving from Calcutta Airport into the centre of the town and seeing all around me literally hundreds of people laying on the streets begging. And amongst them, and I have a picture of one of them in my Bible, amongst them little children begging on the streets of Calcutta. And the Holy Spirit spoke to me in a very vocal way. I heard his voice and he said to me, in whatever situation you find yourself in, you will always be better off than two thirds of the world. And that, beloved, has remained with me for the rest of my life. Whatever situation I find myself in, I will always be better off than two thirds of the world. And you see, we so readily complain about the things that we do not have or the things that we can't afford. But the truth is that all, all of us, are better off than two-thirds of the world. And giving comes from compassion. We sang it just now. It comes from compassion, but it also comes from a recognition of this fact, how blessed we are. And it comes from... a from deep within us because of the resurrection. 1 John 3 verse 17 and 18 asks this question. If anyone has material possessions and sees his brothers in need but has no pity on him, how can the love of God be in him? Dear children, let us not love with words only but in actions and in truth. In other words, beloved, faith needs action. Faith needs action. It really is more blessed to be able to give than to have to beg. Think about that. I am blessed because I'm in a position to be able to give rather than in a position to have to beg. It's true, isn't it? We are blessed. We are blessed. We are blessed. We are blessed. And what a blessing we have, we receive when we see how others have been blessed because of our giving. Well, let me come to my second question. My second question is, 
Should I give even if I'm in debt? And this is a hard one, isn't it? Should I give even if I'm in debt? But really, it comes down to trust. Do I trust God, beloved? Do I trust God to meet my needs? Am I in debt because I have foolishly allowed myself wrong choices? Or is my debt beyond me being able to help myself? We have made a commitment, we have a commitment to firstly pay our debts to our creditors because that's the commitment that we have made. God, beloved, is not an accountant but he does expect us to use our limited resources wisely. So if you can't pay your creditors, should, you should first pay them and trust God to meet your needs. Not your wants, but your needs. Trust God to do it, but at the same time, wisely use your resources in spending. And my third question is closely linked with the second one. How can I give when I have so little? And again, Proverbs 11, verse 25 says, A generous man will prosper. He who refreshes others will himself be refreshed. And as little as we may have, being in a position to help someone else is a blessing, not only to them, but also to us. And God will open up his heaven, it says in Malachi, wasn't it? And pour down such blessings upon us. Now that doesn't always mean that you'll get more money back than you gave, but you, it could mean better health, better family relationships, a deep peace within your heart knowing that you have done what God would want you to do, living as Jesus would have you live. Let me just for a moment take this title and divert. The title, Giving to the Needy. Let me just take it beyond money for a moment. Our God is a, a giving God. I think of all the love that I have received, the forgiveness, the, the, the mercy, all that is around me, all that I see. In fact, everything I have comes from a giving God. Everything I have comes from a giving God. And we are all needy. I need more of God and I need less of myself. We're all needy. And the society that we live in, beloved, is a needy society. They need God. They need comfort. They need peace. They need reassurance. They need a way out of the mess that we're in with Brexit and all these other things that we don't talk about. They need an answer. And the answer is in Jesus. That's the answer. Jesus. We are to be like our Father and we are to give and to give and to give. We are to give to the needy. We are to give time. We are to give love. We are to give reassurance. We are to give. We are to give. We are to give. We are to give above all the means of salvation. Jesus Christ. How will people know if we are not telling them? How will the world know that God loves them, that God has an answer if you and I are not telling them? How will they know if they don't see it in our lives, if they don't hear it in our words? How will they know? We live, beloved, in a needy world. And you and I have the answer in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. You're allowed to get excited about that. Coming back to our, our passage, it's all about trusting God more to meet our needs. Yes, we trust him. But the reality of the resurrection pushes me forward. The re reality of the resurrection makes me want to trust him more. I can trust him. I know I can trust him. He's proved himself to me. Let me end with a personal testimony that happened to Joyce and I just quite recently. When we used to travel each month to Belgium, we used to go... Uh, every month to Belgium to pastor a church there and wherever, whenever we went we always took with us tracks in English um, for a man called Willie who works amongst uh, the seamen coming into Zubruga the Filipinos and so on coming in and also the drivers around, around Zubruga 
We haven't been there for two years, so he's run out of tracks. And he phoned us up quite recently and he said, I urgently need tracks. Can you send some to me? And we said, yes. And then after putting the phone down, we prayed. We said, where are we going to find so many tracks? Who, who can we ask? Where can we, we find, find these tracks? And in the morning, Joyce and I both came up with the same answer. We have phone our friend Eric. We haven't seen him for months and months, but we have phone him and ask him. So I, I phoned, and he picked up the phone, and he said, that's quite amazing, he said. I, I had my hand on the phone, and I was just about to phone you to ask you if you knew anybody who needed a load of tracks and Bible things. This, this is amazes me. If you, if you know anybody that, has, that needs Bible tracks in English, because I need to get rid of them. By the way, why did you phone me? <laughs> and that, beloved, absolutely amazes me. That amazes me. Of all the things going on in the world at this moment, tracks for seamen in Zeebrugge is way down the list. But not for God. Not for God. God cares for every single thing that we do. Two days later, after this, we got the tracks. Two days later, our daughter, Grace, turned up from Belgium, unannounced, unexpected, first time in two years. And she was there in order to take these tracks back again. Don't tell me that God doesn't care, that God doesn't know. You see, beloved, God is very real and very concerned with every part of our lives. And, and we give because we have received so much from God. We've, we've received so much, even our health and our strength, our healing. We, we give because Christ's love and compassion compels us into action. We give because we want to share God's blessing with others. But Jesus in this passage asks us to examine our motives when we give others. So I, I finish with this question. Why... Do we do good works? Is it to bring glory to God? Is that really the motive? Or is it to have brownie points against our name? Do we do it that others might notice and praise us because we have been generous towards someone else? Let's come before the Lord in prayer.